This is a brief analysis of Wilfred Owen's World War I poem Duque et Decorum Est. Uh, not so much an anti-war poem as one that seeks to depict the realities of war and to create an unvarnished tale of what war is. Wilfred Owen wrote this poem, uh, as so many of his poems were written in Craig Lockhart Hospital, uh, under the guidance of Siegfried Sassoon. Uh, it was written in 1917 and it tells the story of a gas attack that um, Wilfred Owen would have endured himself uh, in France in 1917, earlier that year. As a result of this attack and others, he suffered uh, from shell shock and was in Craig Lockhart Hospital to recover from his injuries when he wrote the poem. So beginning with the title, Dulce et Decorum Est, it's a reference to a line from Horace in Latin, the classical writer Horace in Latin, um, meaning uh, it is beautiful and proper, or it is sweet and proper. Uh, the whole line is re reproduced at the end of the poem, Dulce et Decorum Est pro Patria Mori. It is sweet and proper uh, to die for one's home country or to die for one's native land. This also would have been a toast at the time of Wilfred Owen's writing uh, in the early 20th century, that people would have said it is sweet to die for one's country, it is sweeter to live for one's country, and it's sweetest to drink for one's country. So let's drink to one's country. So if we take it as a reference to this toast that was given by the aristocracy and the higher class, um, echelons of society, that perhaps this is a bit of a dig at those who uh, support the war but don't actually go to the war themselves uh, and are getting rich off the war even. Uh, we can see uh, throughout the poem that it has a particular rhyme scheme. It's an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme the whole way through. Uh, some commentators have said that this is uh, looking at uh, this is um, because Wilfred Owen wanted to write two corrupted sonnets put together. Um, I don't quite see that, but we'll, we'll have a, a look at that when we get to the G-E-G-E -G -E pattern of uh, the third stanza. So beginning here at the first stanza, bent double like old beggars under sacks. We see here, like old beggars under sacks is a simile uh, describing the soldiers as being quite... Um, <clears throat> Uh, quite uh, poorly, um, things going poorly for them. Knock need uh, is here an example of this uh, nasal alliteration, the repetition of consonantal sounds in close proximity. Uh, and again, we have a simile that they're coughing like hags. Um, but then we see that it is actually in the first person. We cursed through sludge. And we'll see as we go through... Um, that never do the soldiers just walk. Here they cursed through sludge. Um, here they marched asleep. Uh, they trudge towards a distant rest. Um, and, uh, and they limped on uh, at this point. Always there's some kind of synonym for the word walked um, that adds um, a gravitas or a meaning uh, to what they're doing. So here, cursing through sludge, uh, we get that figurative language uh, describing their journey forwards. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs. Okay, we turned our backs. I think there's a symbolic significance there uh, that they're rejecting the war, that they're turning their backs on the fighting. The flares being haunting, well, it's entirely plausible that the flares actually do haunt the soldiers, uh, but we could also make the argument that there's a sense of personification here. And towards our distant rest, we began to trudge. Be towards our distant rest uh, is a euphemism. Uh, it's both their literal rest away from the battlefield, but also their distant rest as in their eventual deaths their eventual uh, demise uh, and uh, escape from this earthly realm. Men marched asleep. We have the alliteration of another nasal with the M sound, men marched asleep. And then many, uh, again with that M sound, many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. And here we have uh, bloodshod and neologism. Uh, that's the creation of a new word. Uh, bloodshod meaning that their shoe is made out of blood and so we have that quite visceral imagery uh, through that neologism. 
all went lame, all blind. So we have the repetition, or if you like, anaphora of that word all. And this absolute diction um, gives a sense that uh, no one is able to escape from the horrors of war. A drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots. I think the alliteration here of drunk and deaf uh, links these two words, and so that their uh, that their deafness and their drunkness is caused by the same thing. And then we have deaf even to the hoots, so giving the sense that these hoots are quite loud, and one ought not to be deaf to them. But they're the hoots of gas shells that are dropping softly behind. So hoots and softly working together uh, to create a juxtaposition or an irony there that one would expect that these hooting gas shells would not be soft in the way that they drop. And so we get to the end of the first octave. Um, we have an octave and a sextet, um, but then uh, making up a sonnet form. Um, but then we have this tag at the end of it where we continue on uh, the, the sonnet form that we talked about just before. So here we have gas, gas, boy, gas, gas, quick boys. Uh, and so this direct speech that's happening, the repetition of gas, the capitalization of gas, the exclamation mark, the fact that boys here is, um, is used instead of perhaps men, uh, which we could have used as our word there instead. Um, uh, comments on the, well, it is, has connotations of, uh, of their innocence, of the innocence of these uh, young men. An ecstasy of fumbling, uh, ecstasy here being used as a, a collective noun for fumbling, and we've got the irony of ecstasy usually being something so brilliant and so wonderful, here instead being so awful. Uh, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. Uh, the helmets are not literally clumsy, um, but instead we have the personification of making them seem like uh, something living, something, an extension of these young men. We then have the disjunction. So we've been told that we've made it just in time, but then there's a disjunction in the form of but. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. So here we have the uh, simile, like a man in fire or lime, uh, describing this individual, um, that he may as well be in fire or in quicklime. Um, yeah, someone was still yelling out, dim through the misty panes um, of green light uh, and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. So we get this repetition of green and here it's a reference to the fact that chlorine gas uh, was green. But we see him as under a green sea. And so here, uh, the green sea is a metaphor. He's not literally under a sea. In fact, he's um, stuck within the chlorine gas. And that metaphor is continued with the idea of him drowning. Notably, we shift from uh, the first person plural to the first person singular. And it becomes a personal recount of what's happened on this march. So I saw him drowning rather than we saw him drowning. Then we go uh, from the rhyme scheme uh, here being C, D, C, D, uh, uh, sorry, E, F, E, F, G, E, and then G, E again, as if we're tagging on to the end of this sonnet. In all my dreams, uh, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. So with the guttering, choking, drowning, these three gerunds, uh, we have a tricolon. And the fact that it's in all my dreams, um, that absolute diction again, but uh, the fact that they're in dreams gives a sense of time and distance uh, from what's being experienced here, as if things have gone on after. Uh, after this march and that the persona of the poem is remembering these things uh, a long time afterwards. The fact that the help, the site is helpless, we could argue, is an example of personification, if we like. Um, and then he plunges at me. Uh, that, that plosive P sound, I think, is quite powerful there and is, creates quite an arresting image just on its own. At this point here, we get the volta of the poem, the turning point of the poem. And so we go from a, a recount of what's happened on the march to the persona directly addressing uh, the, 
uh, the reader of the poem or the listener of the poem and we get that through that second person address if uh, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon and so also we have the um, some smothering dreams uh, that uh, assonance uh, sorry not assonance that uh, sibilance a special kind of alliteration um, or the repetition of an S sound, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. And that word flung being particularly evocative and creating this, uh, this image, having these connotations of carelessness. Uh, we have the alliteration as well of uh, wagon we um, happening at this point in the poem. Uh, which continues on to the next line as well. Uh, watch the white eyes. That what 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 sound um, I think creates sort of a dizzying tone almost. Watch the white eyes. Whoa 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 whoa. Uh, as if things are just spinning around. Watch the white eyes writhing in his face. Uh, again, you get quite an evocative image with the eyes writhing uh, in the face, even though that is literally what would have been happening. His hanging face, so we get that repetition of his uh, his face, his hanging face uh, like a devil sick of sin. And so here we have the uh, simile. Um, there's much discussion about what it actually means, like a devil sick of sin. Uh, to me, it seems that it's a devil's face and it's sick because it's full of sin. And so if a devil uh, who is uh, innately sinful is sick because of how much sin they have, surely the corruption or, um, of that figure is, is um, gross, is, is huge. If you could hear, so we get that repetition of if coming through, that if, if, um, that refrain or an afro, or if you just like just a simple repetition, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling, uh, here we have that auditory imagery uh, linked to here, um, come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, again that, um, that auditory imagery, that oral imagery from froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, we have two um, two similes uh, right after each other and bitter as the cud continues on to the next line bitter as the cud through this enjambment here of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues uh, the vile incurable uh, of uh, the vile incurable sores on innocent tongues here being a metaphor um, that's how bitter it is it's as bitter as this metaphorical thing uh, my friend, and so we go uh, from the direct address of you to a more intimate address of my friend, uh, perhaps with a touch of irony there or a touch of um, an acerbic tone that, that we're not really a friend of theirs because perhaps we're telling young children that it's a good and proper to die for one's native land. So one, my friend, drawing in the intimacy of the reader, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. Uh, children, here we have the image of innocence, which uh, is picked up from earlier when we had the boys at the gas attack. Gas, gas, quick boys. Um, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie. Lie here being personified through that capitalization. Um, and so that it is something pervasive and something sick that's going to actually have quite a strong impact on those who hear it. And then we hear the line coming from Horace, um, coming from... Uh, tales that would have been told to children as they're learning their Latin, as they're learning their declensions and their conjugations. Um, so too are they learning this message that it is sweet and proper to die for one's native land. Uh, so that's our brief analysis of Duque et Decorum Est.